This is going to be a series of talks about general relativity. I'm entitling it Curved Space and Time. Uh, and uh, as the slide says, it's an introduction to general relativity very closely following uh, John Archibald Wheeler's presentation um, in a few places, but especially uh, a classic book called Space-Time Physics. So uh, very little of this uh, way of talking about things is, is original to me. Uh, Wheeler is a master at intuitive uh, yet mathematically and physically correct descriptions. So let me start the way he starts with what uh, he calls the parable of the travelers. And this will be part one of the parable of the travelers. So there's two travelers. They dislike each other, so they start uh, their journeys, um, even though they're kind of doing something as a team, they start them 10, ten kilometers apart, exactly east-west from each other. And their names are Abe and Betty. And they march straight north, exactly straight north, and we're just supposed to assume that they are incredibly um, accurate at that. They march at exactly the same pace with incredible accuracy. And what they expect is they expect when they just call each other on the phone or see each other across a flat plane or something to stay exactly 10 kilometers apart. What they notice is that after 200 kilometers of travel going north, they are not quite 10 kilometers apart anymore. They're five meters closer to each other. Now, that wouldn't be so weird, except that I, these assumptions that they are going exactly straight, exactly north, exactly the same pace, they really shouldn't be any closer to each other. They should be, um, the, their paths should form a rectangle like this. Here's their paths, and here was 10 kilometer separation. This really should be 10 kilometers. But what we discover is it's actually 9.995 kilometers. It's a small effect, but it's not zero. And that's really, really strange. It, the travelers say, gosh, this is bizarre. This seems to violate um, all the rules of geometry that we expect, by which they mean Euclidean geometry, the ordinary Euclidean geometry of a flat plane. Now, they don't get too weirded out by this. They're, they, they don't throw up their hands. They, they keep marching. And something even weirder happens. They keep getting closer and closer and closer together. And eventually, they hit each other. They were trying to stay parallel to each other. They were trying to make basically a rectangle, and yet they've made a weird triangle. So remember, these sides, even though I'm starting to, I'm having to draw them as, as something that looks curved in the picture, these are straight lines by any reasonable physical definition. They are uh, lines, uh, the, the, these paths they're marching on, they're not turning at all. And we're supposed to assume that they're perfectly straight, and yet they are meeting each other, even though they started out both perpendicular to the same baseline. So nobody turned, and yet we made a triangle. They hit each other. Another thing that's weird is Euclidean geometry says that if you do have a triangle, which this is, three straight lines, then the sum of the angles in any triangle should be exactly 180 degrees. But clearly, it's more, because this is 90. That's 90. That's 180 right there. Whatever this angle is, is extra. And it contradicts one of the most basic facts of ordinary Euclidean geometry, which is known as the parallel postulate. There's a few different forms of it, but one of them is that if you have this situation where you have one line and then these two lines perpendic both perpendicular to it, they should be parallel, namely they shouldn't ever meet. And yet, in fact, they are meeting. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, what's happening is, of course, they're doing this on the surface of the Earth, and the Earth is a sphere. And its geometry is absolutely not Euclidean geometry. It is curved, and it doesn't obey the usual rules of straight lines and angles and, and triangles and rectangles that planar geometry does. There's nothing really, really strange about this. It's just we don't have to deal with it in a very explicit way that much. But if you're looking at a globe, you can easily see some of the weird things about this. So first of all, let's get clear what is a straight line? So you might say, well, it's a curved surface. There's no such thing as a straight line. But it's much, much better to relax yourself a little bit and say it doesn't have to be look straight from the outside. It just has to look straight from the perspective of somebody on the Earth. And namely, there's a couple of definitions. One is it's any path that if you go along it, you're just not turning. So for example, going from the South Pole to the North Pole along a line of longitu longitude, that is a straight line in the sense that if you go along that line, you will never feel yourself to be turning. You're going straight north the whole time. Um, another way to describe it is it should be a curve that's locally length minimizing, which is a fancy way to say that if you put a string between two points on this globe and you stretch it tight, that's going to be 
a, um, a geodesic. So the, geode the term geodesic replaces the term straight line, although I still might call them straight lines because they're really the, the closest thing you can get to a straight line on this curved surface in this curved geometry. Um, so, for example, uh, longitude lines, I talked about how those are geodesics. In fact, any piece of a great circle, so you just cut the sphere with a plane through the center, and you can have a tilted version of a longitude line, and that will still be a geodesic. Um, the equator is a geodesic. Any longitude line. Latitude lines are very much not geodesics. It's not that hard, it's not that easy to see how like the 20 degree latitude line going around here, for example, would not be a geodesic because it looks a lot like the equator. And I claim that if you're on the equator and you start marching eastward and never turning, you're going to stay on the equator. That's fine. It's a much easier to see that, say, the 89.9 .9 degree uh, latitude line is definitely not a geodesic. That's going to be a small circle around the North Pole. Even at, for just looking at the North Pole and even looking locally, which is an important principle here, to look at the thing locally. If you look at the 89.9 .9 or even 89.999 degree uh, lat latitude line, it's going to be a small circle around the North Pole. Nobody's going to say that's a straight line. The equator looks curved from the global perspective, but if you zoom in on any piece of the equator, it looks very, very straight, and you, you can walk along it without turning at all. Similarly for the lines of longitude, which are great circles. So that's an important point, is that there's a very di big difference between latitude lines and longitude lines. Admitted, the 20 degree latitude line isn't very curved, even from the perspective of this geometry. But it is, it is not, in fact, um, the analog of straight lines, not a geodesic. So in non-Euclidean geometry, like the geometry of the sphere, um, many facts that we know from Euclidean geometry, from high school geometry, are just false. They are, they are facts about Euclidean geometry, but they're not general facts about any kind of geometry. The parallel postulate, for example. Clearly, this longitude line and this other longitude line, they are both perpendicular to the equator at, at different points, but they meet at the north and south poles. And in fact, there's no such thing, basically, as parallel lines on a sphere, because any two great circles are going to intersect, just like all these longitude lines do at the poles. The angle sum of a triangle is, in fact, always more than 180 degrees never exactly 180. It gets close to 180 if you draw a very tiny little triangle, like just draw one on the floor of your room, uh, then that's going to seem very close to flat because you're not en encompassing a lot of the curvature of this, of this huge sphere that the Earth is. But any, um, any triangle with, that's on a substantial portion of the, of the sphere, you'll notice a deviation from 180. For example, you can have a 90-90-90 triangle. Just take, say, um, the zero degree meridian and the 90 degree, there's a 90 degree uh, angle here, there's a 90 degree angle here at the equator, and there's a 90 degree angle here. So two half or two, yeah, two half longitude lines in the equator makes a 90, 90, 90 triangle. That angle sums up to 270. Uh, we've already seen that rectangles basically don't really exist in, in curved geometry in the sense that we usually want them to, having congruent opposite sides and four 90 degree, tri 90 degree angles. It just doesn't work. Similar triangles don't exist. Uh, it's another weird thing that doesn't work in Euclidean geometry. And the usual relationship between the area and the circumference of a circle, that turns out to change. And it turns out that that's um, a very significant fact of sort of measuring how different you are from flat geometry. So we just what we say is that this, the sphere is curved. And the, the important thing here is that the sphere, we're thinking of not as an object in some bigger space, but as a place to live. The parable of the travelers, I didn't start out by saying they're on a sphere. I was just saying, here they go. They're in some place, and they do some travel, and they discover what happens when they do that. This is called the intrinsic point of view you know, on the geometry, that we don't think of the sphere as embedded in something bigger. We just think of it as, as the whole universe. But the properties of people going around the surface, they can discover what's weird about it without ever having to have this external point of view, even though the external point of view is very convenient. That's really crucial, going to be crucial when we get to thinking about the curvature of space-time in our universe, because you don't want to have to think that it has to be inside something bigger. It's a very common mistake. Here, um, this kind of curvature that the sphere has, it makes geodesics tend to converge. When you take to these two things that are trying to stay parallel, they're always going to be drawn together and tend to converge. There's other kinds of con curvature that makes things diverge. Um, but this is a kind that convert goes, it makes it converge. It's called positive curvature. Um, another thing that's not too crucial to um, 
our story is that the sphere has a different topology from the plane, meaning that even if you could squish it and stretch it, you couldn't turn it into a plane because it closes up on itself and it's not infinite. It doesn't have infinite extent. Um, and it encloses something in a precise sense. You could also imagine a, the surface of a donut being the traveler's sort of universe or a, the surface of a pretzel. Various different two-dimensional surfaces uh, with fundamentally different shapes, not just geometrically, but in terms of the number of holes they have and whether they go off to infinity or not. So it turns out that that's a distinct issue from geometry, but it's related. There's a lot of deep connections between geometry and topology. So I'll come back to that just a tiny bit later. Okay. Um, let me finish the parable of the travelers, and then we'll um, switch to an, a new video. Part two of the parable of the travelers. Um, let's say the travelers are totally uh, ignorant of the fact that they're on a curved surface. They just, they're still mystified by this. Let's go back to where they've only gone 200 kilometers. They haven't even gone to the point where they uh, hit each other. Um, they start out 10 kilometers apart. After 200 kilometers of travel, they're slightly closer to each other. Here's their, a natural explanation they might have. Oh, there's a mysterious force that is pulling us together as we travel. Um, okay, when, when you detect some deviation from where you expect to go, it's a reasonable explanation, but there's some stuff that's a little bit weird about this force. So the fundamental thing about forces is that force equals mass times acceleration. That if you're acted on by a force, given your mass, you can figure out how much you're going to be affected by that. The acceleration is going to depend on the force and your mass. And so um, if that is the usual, if what's going on here is that there's a force, then the different masses of, say, Abe is bigger than Betty, or Abe is carrying some objects that are of di various different masses, um, you'd expect that all those things with different masses would give different accelerations. And yet what they discover is that, in fact, they, all those things seem to be experiencing the same acceleration. Now, remember, we know why they're being pulled together. There is no mysterious force. There's no such thing. They're inevitably being pulled together because of the geometry of the sphere. They're following straight lines, and they're doing nothing wrong, and there's nothing actively pulling them together. It's just the way geodesics work on this sphere that happens. But they don't know that. So they're very naturally making up this mysterious force, but it has this very interesting property. It's giving the same effect, the same effect in terms of moving things around, essentially the same acceleration for all objects. And so what they, may, what they say is, oh, the, the force must be proportional to the mass. So that means that if you double the mass, you double this, and you double the m, the a stays the same. The only way this would work if there is a mysterious force going on is if the force is proportional to the mass of every object. Okay, that's a weird thing, but it's still, it's a, it's a logical possibility. And of course, the, um, the interesting thing is that's exactly how we think of our universe. This weird and incorrect way for the travelers to describe their situation is exactly how we're tempted to think of our universe ever since Newton. And we'll talk about that in the next video.